Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches Macbeth. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the significance of the witches. I'm gonna give you five key ideas about the witches and their presentation and their overall significance to the play. It's gonna focus on language, structure and form. And of course, there is plenty to say about context. So the overall video should give you a really great frame for planning an essay. Without any further ado, let's get started. So let's talk about the fact that the witches open the entire play. So structurally, this is really significant. The play is called Macbeth, but it doesn't open with Macbeth. That immediately shows that these characters that open the play, that start the play, are as important as the titular character. Now let's have a look at how they're introduced. So we start off learning that they are in a desert place. Some editions say that they're on a battlefield, as in the battlefield. Uh, either way, it doesn't matter because either it represents them as being isolated and away from society or it represents them as being a kind of symbol of violence. So whichever way your edition, there's still a nice point. They are also introduced with thunder and lightning. Now, this pathetic fallacy is really important because whenever the witches appear, there is always thunder and lightning. So it cements this idea of their power again, because they're associated with powerful weather, but that also has the capacity for massive destruction and violence. So it's a really, really fitting kind of symbol for the witches. They also are in threes, which is a sort of supernatural number. The fact that there are three witches, they all speak in order, first, second, third, first, second, third, first, second, third. And look, they also even use triads um, in their language, in thunder, lightning, or in rain, triads or list of three, whatever you prefer. And again, notice the way that we have got this pathetic fallacy um, re-emphasized again to us here. They will meet in thunder, lightning, or in rain. The second which also says, well, um, we'll also meet when the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. The hurly-burly is another word for the war, the kind of chaos of war. So they're saying, okay, well, once the war is done, that's when we'll meet, and that will be uh, the set of sun, air means before. So there's a kind of not, like they have this sort of future knowledge. Well, they know when the war's gonna be over, that's gonna be before the sun sets, so we'll meet again then to meet with Macbeth. So we're getting this idea of the witches as supernatural creatures associated with powerful dark weather, isolated from society, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with this kind of future supernatural knowledge. Now this fits in with a vast number of kind of ideas of the time, the contemporary audience of the time, really strongly believed in witches and thought that they could fly and that they could tell the future. And a lot of their beliefs came from the fact that King James I, who was the king at the time that the play was written, had a massive fear of witches. It's not just, oh, they're a little bit worrying. He thought that they were plotting to kill him. He even wrote a book about them called Demonology, which is all about like, um, you know, how to spot a witch and what to do with a witch once you've found them. And it's quite gruesome. Um, and so Macbeth, by introducing the witches at this point, rep, like introducing these villains, he's playing to King James and what King James would have wanted to see. Later on in the play, um, for example, he actually talks about them um, cursing a ship as an act of petty vengeance. And that's exactly what King James thought they did to him. They thought he, they cursed his ship and tried to kill him. So Shakespeare's being quite clever here. The other thing that he's doing right from word go is he's setting up that the witches have a different form. So if you don't know much about Shakespeare's form, one like a couple of bits of terminology that you might want is that um, the main characters, they use blank verse, which is uh, another way of saying non-rhyming iambic pentameter. Um, and, and if you want a little bit more info on this, I'll, I'll pop a little tag to a video on um, Act 1, Scene 1 of Macbeth, which gives you lots and lots of useful stuff about form. Um, but yeah, most of the noble characters speak in iambic pentameter. And then your villains, or your sort of low status characters, they tend to use prose, which is just normal talk, just like I'm talking to you right now. The witches, 
they get something totally different. They get trochaic tetrameter. So that means that their speech will always sound different to the speech of the good characters. The main difference is, is that the stress is on the first syllable of each um, two syllable foot and that there are only eight syllables per line as opposed to ten. If that's a bit like, ooh, ooh, miss what you're talking about, just remember that they use trochaic tetrameter and that marks them out as different from any other character. Shakespeare is saying these witches are less than human. They're not just low status, they're something else completely. So they get their own special way of speaking. Okay, so Shakespeare starts the play by giving us a description of the witches. Uh, or giving us a scene with the witches, and then we hear about Macbeth. Um, but what he actually also does is that he links these two characters together. So the last thing that the witches say in Act 1, Scene 1 is this. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy X. Brilliant rhyming couplet. Um, and you've got all sorts of lovely things. You've got fricative alliteration, you've got repetition, you've got antithesis, you've got language that is associated with witchcraft, it's in hovering, levitating, and we've got these kind of links to a really big theme about appearance and reality. They're saying here, what seems to be good is evil, what seems to be evil is good. It's all about the confusion that is going to be presented through this play. It's excellent bit of foreshadowing, but that's not the only reason it's excellent, because in Act 1, Scene 3, when we finally get to meet Macbeth for the first time, check out his first lines. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. Look at the way that Shakespeare echoes the antithesis. He echoes these adjectives foul and fair. So it means that the first thing Macbeth says makes you think back to the witches, showing that either they're linked in some way or that uh, the witches will have a great influence on Macbeth, which is obviously true. Clever Shakespeare. Very, very clever Shakespeare. OK, these sneaky witches, why else are they important? Well, they are catalysts, of the violence. They're like a plot catalyst. They get everything going. Some people say if it wasn't for them, nothing would happen. So um, I haven't put the initial prophecies in here. I think you know what they are. Um, but after Macbeth has heard the prophecies, this is just in Act 1, Scene 3. Look how his mind starts to work. First things first, we've got the dramatic device of an aside. That basically means that he is speaking out his thoughts to the audience and all of the other characters on stage can't like hear what he's saying. So you know that you're getting like a direct line into his mind. He says two truths are told. So that is the first two prophecies. OK, glance, he already was, cordial. So that's your prophecy, glance, cordial, king. And he says two truths are told because he's just been told that he's Thane of Cordor. As happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. Now, look at this metaphor. A prologue in a literary text is like that little bit that comes before. It's almost like a little introduction. It's what you need to know before it begins. Note that it's personified as well, happy prologues. So that means that being Thane of Glans and being Thane of Cordor are like the happy prologues, the happy beginnings of the rest of the play, the swelling act, note this word that suggests getting bigger, of the imperial theme. Now, imperial connotes majesty. So he's basically saying in Act 1, Scene 3, right, OK, Thane of Glam's done, tick. Thane of Cordor, tick, what's to come? So his brain is already taking him to kingship. And then within the very next scene, when Duncan names his son Malcolm as the heir to the throne, i.e. the Prince of Cumberland, Macbeth, again in an aside, so you know that no one can hear this but us, the audience, he says the Prince of Cumberland, 
that is a step on which I must fall down or else overleap, for in my way it lies. Let's start there. So Prince of Cumberland is Malcolm. Look at the way that he dehumanises him through these metaphors. So first off, he refers to him as a step that's either going to trip him up, which I must fall down, or else overleap. So he's like, right, you are either the thing that's going to stop me or I'm going to find a way to jump over you to become king. And then he says, for in my way, it lies. Again, that it, that pronoun it is the Prince of Cumberland. He is the step. Yeah. So the use of the pronoun it rather than he dehumanizes him, which is a little subtle hint of what he might be thinking, because if you dehumanize someone, perhaps it makes it easier to consider them as a victim or as, as someone that you can get rid of. And then look at the next thought. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. So personifying the stars, using imperatives to give them orders. Stars hide your fires. So he's like, put out the light. I, I want everything to go dark because he doesn't want light to see his black and deep desires. Note that juxtaposition between light suggesting goodness and the black and deep desires suggesting the kind of dark, violent, cruel thoughts he's already having. So he has gone from being a ah, brave, noble warrior in Act 1, Scene 2. Within two scenes, because of what he heard from the witches, he is already having those black and deep desires. So the witches, catalysts of the play. Context. This is a biggie because what he's considering here, even before he's actually got to the specific thoughts of regicide, i.e. killing the king, his thoughts are treasonous. Yeah, his thoughts betray the king. The fact that he is plotting here to get rid of the Prince of Cumberland is treason. Now, the Jacobean audience of the time would have been horrified. This is already cementing the darkness of Macbeth. And don't forget that regicide, that means the killing of a king. You know, in a, for a, I mean, obviously it's horrific, but a Jacobean audience would believe that killing the king would create complete chaos and disorder on earth. That was the belief. You, you mess with the divine right of kings, i.e. God's choice of who is his vessel, the whole world um, erupts into chaos. So that is what these black and deep desires are. And that's why he wants the stars to hide the fires so that no one can see just how treasonous his thoughts are. Another good point to make about the witches is to look at the way that they highlight the differences between Banquo and Macbeth. OK, so first off, let's look at what they say to Banquo, because quite often people remember the Macbeth prophecies, but forget that Banquo has his own. So he's told that he'll be lesser than Macbeth and greater and not so happy yet much happier, which feels quite ambiguous and unclear. But essentially what they're saying here is you won't have like the status, you won't have the sort of obvious things that would make someone happy, but by nature, you're gonna be a greater person. So you might not have the title, but you will have the virtue and the goodness that would make you better than Macbeth. But it's this prophecy, it's the third prophecy that's most important because the witches tell him that even though he won't ever be king, his sons, will be king. So thou shalt get kings means your line, you know, so your sons will be king. So this is quite exciting because if you think the one thing that Macbeth struggles with, maybe not the one thing, but a huge thing that Macbeth struggles with in this play is that he has no line. So becoming king is all very well, but he's got no one to pass it on to. Whereas Banquo gets that continuity which is far far better and that's one of the reasons that he's a he's like a threat to Macbeth but if you think Macbeth when he hears these prophecies he immediately goes into his own mind you start to see his asides he's having dark thoughts even Banquo says oh our partner's wrapped with all as in he's caught up in his thoughts whereas Banquo has a totally different line on it he says, and he says this directly to Macbeth, it's a warning. 
He says, oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. So he's saying there, watch it, hang on a minute, they might be giving us these little tidbits of truth, i.e. Thane of Glam, Thane of Cordor, so that they can then go on to betray you once they've hooked you in and got your trust. And Banquo is bang on here. That's exactly what they do to Macbeth. So Shakespeare is showing Banquo to be incredibly wise and careful in juxtaposition to Macbeth, who is impulsive and kind of greedy at the idea of his progression. Now, this is done for a specific reason. It, this isn't actually true. It's been disproved. But the point is, is that the Jacobean audience of the time believed that King James, so the, the king of the time, was a descendant of Banquo. So when Shakespeare wrote the play, or wrote the play, <laughs> he would have been thinking, right, Banquo is his descendant. Um, oh, sorry, Banquo is his like, great, 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 great granddaddy. I need to make sure that I paint him in a good light so King James is flattered, you know. So that's the reason why Banquo always stays true to his morals, is never corrupted by Macbeth, is never interested in the witches. And even later on in the play, when um, Macbeth goes back to view the witches, he gets to see this prophecy, uh, he gets to see this vision of Banquo's line. And as he looks down these, this line of king after king after king after king, there's even an image of King James coming from that cauldron. So Shakespeare's really like doffing his cap to the king there saying, yeah, yeah, you're a descendant of Banquo and look how good Banquo is. And the witches are a vehicle for that. The witches also incite Macbeth's hubris. OK, I'll explain the word hubris in just a second, because there's another moment of going back to our lovely Aristotle and his theory of the tragic hero, his concept of the tragic hero. If you looked at my video on violence, you'd have seen some stuff on how tragic heroes begin, which is um, that they're always kind of noble heroes that then kind of fall from grace. And the better they are, the bigger their fall. But one trait that they tend to have um, is this thing called hubris. And hubris is pride or extreme overconfidence that happens just before their demise, just before their fall. And here we have the witches creating this feeling of invincibility. So this is the second apparition, so the second set of prophecies. There are three to look at, but I, thought, I think this one's brilliant. And they say, be bloody, bold and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. So first off, note the imperative again, they're giving him the instruction. And in the instruction, we have a triad or a list of three, depending on what you prefer to call it. They're saying be bloody, so be violent, gruesome, be bold. OK, so don't be frightened of anything. Be strong and resolute i.e. stick to your guns. You want to do something, you go and do it. Yeah, and then they give him a reason why he should feel this way. Because none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. So they're basically saying any man that was born by a woman, i.e. everyone, well, they can't hurt you. So just laugh at them. Just don't worry about them. You can be bloody, bold and resolute. No one's ever going to stop you. This makes him feel invincible, i.e it incites his hubris, that feeling of overconfidence or pride, extreme overconfidence before a fall. And look what he says in Act 5, Scene 3, when he has got soldiers coming, pouring in on him to fight, to, to take him down. And he says, bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. So that's his own men that are flying. So he's like, I don't want to hear about all of the men deserting me. It doesn't matter. Till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. So that was the third prophecy. So just like, you know, until a woman, until a man that was born by a woman, you know, you don't have anything to worry about. Likewise, you don't have anything to worry about until a forest gets up to move. And then he says, what's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? Malcolm was born of a woman. Why do I have to be frightened by him? So the witches here incite Macbeth's hubris. Now, here's the funny thing about hubris and what the witches are up to. 
if they hadn't given him those three new prophecies, there is a chance that he wouldn't have gone and killed Macduff's family. But because he is given Macduff's name, Beware Macduff, and because he is told that nothing can stop him, that he is invincible, he starts being more reckless. He starts doing things without thinking, including killing Macduff's entire family and line, which is one of the reasons that Macduff is so full of righteous kind of fury, and it therefore leads to his end. So the witch's trickery here is massive. They are literally tricking him into doing things that bring about his own demise. That's it from me. Thank you for watching. There are some other things that we could talk about in terms of witchcraft. I'm sure you can go back to it. And if you've got any questions about anything that I haven't covered, do just pop them in the comments and I'll come back to you with some thoughts or some ideas or some quotes. Um, I will just say before I sign off, watch out for any scenes that involve Hecate because she does pop up a couple of times. I've not popped it in here because I don't think it's that useful, but I just wanted to give you a word of warning. Those scenes that involve Hecate, where Hecate speaks herself, those weren't actually written by Shakespeare. So the, mo the most obvious one is Act 3, Scene 5, where there's this really big speech from Hecate where she tells off the first witch. That was written by a chap called Thomas Middleton about 20 years after the, the original um, performances of Macbeth. And that's because as times changed, so did people's desire in terms of what they wanted to see in witches. And they wanted them to be a little bit more sing song, do a dance. And so that's why we've got these slightly odd scenes. So if you ever see Hecate, it wasn't actually written by Shakespeare. That's why it feels a bit funny. It's all sort of in rhyming couplets with like elves dancing. Um, but otherwise, everything I've included in this PowerPoint would actually create a rock'em sock'em essay plan. So do have a little look at it, have a practice, maybe write out some paragraphs, see how it feels. Come back to me with any questions, just pop them in the comments. If you haven't subscribed, click that button and then you will get more from me. You will see when my new videos are being posted. Otherwise, thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Happy revising.